Chapter 8 Psychology and Literature It is obvious enough that psychology, being the study of psychic processes, can be brought to bear upon the study of literature, for the human psyche is the womb of all the sciences and arts. We may expect psychological research, on the one hand, to explain the formation of a work of art, and on the other, to reveal the factors that make a person artistically creative. The psychologist is thus faced with two separate and distinct tasks, and must approach them in radically different ways. In the case of the work of art, we have to deal with a product of complicated psychic activities, but a product that is apparently intentional and consciously shaped. In the case of the artist, we must deal with the psychic apparatus itself, in the first instance, we must attempt the psychological analysis of a definitely circumscribed and concrete artistic achievement, while in the second, we must analyze the living and creative human being as a unique personality. Although these two undertakings are closely related and even interdependent, neither of them can yield the explanations that are sought by the other. It is, of course, possible to draw inferences about the artist from the work of art and vice versa, but these inferences are never conclusive. At best, they are probable surmises or lucky guesses. A knowledge of Goethe's particular relation to his mother throws some light upon Faust's exclamation, The mothers, mothers, how very strange it sounds. But it does not enable us to see how the attachment to his mother could produce the Faust drama itself. However, unmistakably, we sense in the man Goethe a deep connection between the two. Nor are we more successful in reasoning in the reverse direction. There is nothing in the Ring of the Nibelungs that would enable us to recognize or definitely infer the fact that Wagner occasionally liked to wear womanish clothes. Though hidden connections exist between the heroic masculine world of the Nibelungs and a certain pathological effeminacy in the man Wagner. The present state of development of psychology does not allow us to establish those rigorous causal connections which we expect of a science. It is only in the realm of the psychophysiological instincts and reflexes that we can confidently operate with the idea of causality. From the point where psychic life begins, that is, at a level of greater complexity, the psychologist must content himself with more or less widely ranging descriptions of happenings and with the vivid portrayal of the warp and weft of the mind in all its amazing intricacy. In doing this, he must refrain from designating any one psychic process taken by itself as necessary. Were this not the state of affairs, and could the psychologist be relied upon to uncover the causal connections within a work of art, and in the process of artistic creation, he would leave the study of art no ground to stand on, and would reduce it to a special branch of his own science. The psychologist, to be sure, may never abandon his claim to investigate and establish causal relations in complicated psychic events. To do so would be to deny psychology the right to exist, yet he can never make good this claim in the fullest sense because the creative aspect of life, which finds its clearest expression in art, baffles all attempts at rational formulation. Any reaction to stimulus may be causally explained. But the creative act, which is the absolute antithesis of mere reaction, will forever elude the human understanding. It can only be described in its manifestations. It can be obscurely sensed, but never wholly grasped. Psychology and the study of art will always have to turn to one another for help, and the one will not invalidate the other. It is an important principle of psychology that psychic events are derivable. It is a principle in the study of art that a psychic product is something in and for itself whether the work of art or the artist himself is in question. Both principles are valid in spite of their relativity. 1. The Work of Art there is a fundamental difference of approach between the psychologist's examination of a literary work and that of the literary critic. What is of decisive importance and value for the latter may be quite irrelevant for the former. Literary products of highly dubious merit are often of the greatest interest to the psychologist, 
For instance, the so-called psychological novel is by no means as rewarding for the psychologist as the literary-minded suppose. Considered as a whole, such a novel explains itself. It has done its own work of psychological interpretation, and the psychologist can at most criticize or enlarge upon this. The important question as to how a particular author came to write a particular novel is, of course, left unanswered. But I wish to reserve this general problem for the second part of my essay. The novels which are most fruitful for the psychologist are those in which the author has not already given a psychological interpretation of his characters, and which therefore leave room for analysis and explanation, or even invite it by their mode of presentation. Good examples of this kind of writing are the novels of Benoit and English fiction in the manner of Ryder Haggard, including the vein exploited by Conan Doyle, which yields the most cherished article of mass production: the detective story. Melville's Moby Dick, which I consider the greatest American novel, also comes within this class of writings. An exciting narrative that is apparently quite devoid of psychological exposition is just what interests the psychologist most of all. Such a tale is built upon a groundwork of implicit psychological assumptions, and in the measure that the author is unconscious of them, they reveal themselves pure and unalloyed to the critical discernment. In the psychological novel, on the other hand, the author himself attempts to reshape his material so as to raise it from the level of crude contingency to that of psychological exposition and illumination, a procedure which all too often clouds the psychological significance of the work or hides it from view. It is precisely to novels of this sort that the layman goes for psychology. While it is novels of the other kind that challenge the psychologist, for he alone can give them deeper meaning. I have been speaking in terms of the novel, but I am dealing with a psychological fact which is not restricted to this particular form of literary art. We meet with it in the works of the poets as well, and are confronted with it when we compare the first and second parts of the Faust drama. The love tragedy of Gretchen explains itself. There is nothing that the psychologist can add to it that the poet has not already said in better words. The second part, on the other hand, calls for explanation. The prodigious richness of the imaginative material has so overtaxed the poet's formative powers that nothing is self-explanatory, and every verse adds to the reader's need of an interpretation. The two parts of Faust illustrate, by way of extremes, this psychological distinction between works of literature. In order to emphasize the distinction, I will call the one mode of artistic creation psychological, and the other visionary. The psychological mode deals with materials drawn from the realm of human consciousness. For instance, with the lessons of life, with emotional shocks, the experience of passion, and the crises of human destiny in general. All of which go to make up the conscious life of man and his feeling life in particular. This material is psychically assimilated by the poet, raised from the commonplace to the level of poetic experience, and given an expression which forces the reader to greater clarity and depth of human insight by bringing fully into his consciousness what he ordinarily evades and overlooks, or senses only with a feeling of dull discomfort. The poet's work is an interpretation and illumination of the contents of consciousness, of the ineluctable experiences of human life, with its eternally recurrent sorrow and joy. He leaves nothing over for the psychologist, unless indeed we expect the latter to expound the reasons for which Faust falls in love with Gretchen, or which drive Gretchen to murder her child. Such themes go to make up the lot of humankind. They repeat themselves millions of times and are responsible for the monotony of the police court and of the penal code. No obscurity whatever surrounds them, for they fully explain themselves. Countless literary works belong to this class. The many novels dealing with love, the environment, the family, crime, and society, as well as didactic poetry, the larger number of lyrics, and the drama, both tragic and comic. Whatever its particular firm may be, the psychological work of art always takes its materials from the vast realm of conscious human experience, from the vivid foreground of life. We might say, I have called this mode of artistic creation psychological because, in its activity, it nowhere transcends the bounds of psychological intelligibility.
Everything that it embraces, the experience as well as its artistic expression, belongs to the realm of the understandable. Even the basic experiences themselves, though non-rational, have nothing strange about them. On the contrary, they are that which has been known from the beginning of time, passion and its faded outcome, man's subjection to the turns of destiny, eternal nature with its beauty and its horror. The profound difference between the first and second parts of Faust marks the difference between the psychological and the visionary modes of artistic creation. The latter reverses all the conditions of the former. The experience that furnishes the material for artistic expression is no longer familiar. It is a strange something that derives its existence from the hinterland of man's mind. That suggests the abyss of time separating us from pre-human ages, or evokes a superhuman world of contrasting light and darkness. It is a primordial experience which surpasses man's understanding, and to which he is therefore in danger of succumbing. The value and the force of the experience are given by its enormity, It arises from timeless depths. It is foreign and cold, many-sided, demonic, and grotesque. A grimly ridiculous sample of the eternal chaos, the crime of high treason, to use Nietzsche's words, it bursts asunder our human standards of value and of aesthetic form. The disturbing vision of monstrous and meaningless happenings that in every way exceed the grasp of human feeling and comprehension makes quite other demands upon the powers of the artist than do the experiences of the foreground of life. These never rend the curtain that veils the cosmos. They never transcend the bounds of the humanly possible, and for this reason are readily shaped to the demands of art, no matter how great a shock to the individual they may be. But the primordial experiences rend from top to bottom the curtain upon which is painted the picture of an ordered world and allow a glimpse into the unfathomed abyss of what has not yet become. Is it a vision of other worlds, or of the obscuration of the spirit, or of the beginning of things before the age of man, or of the unborn generations of the future? We cannot say that it is any or none of these. Shaping reshaping the eternal spirit's eternal pastime. We find such vision in the shepherd of Hermas, in Dante, in the second part of Faust, in Nietzsche's Dionysian exuberance, in Wagner's Nibelungenring, in Spietler's Olympic Spring, in the poetry of William Blake, in the Ipneritomachia of the monk Francesco Coyona, and in Jacob Bohem's philosophic and poetic stammerings. In a more restricted and specific way, the primordial experience furnishes material for Ryder Haggard in the fiction cycle that turns upon she, and it does the same for Benoit, chiefly in Atlantis, for Kubin in The Other Side, for Merink in The Green Face, a book whose importance we should not undervalue, for Guts in The Kingdom Within, and for Barlock in The Dead Day. This list might be greatly extended. In dealing with the psychological mode of artistic creation, we never need ask ourselves what the material consists of or what it means. But this question forces itself upon us as soon as we come to the visionary mode of creation. We are astonished, taken aback, confused, put on our guard, or even disgusted, and we demand commentaries and explanations. We are reminded in nothing of everyday human life but rather of dreams, nighttime fears, and the dark recesses of the mind that we sometimes sense with misgiving. The reading public, for the most part, repudiates this kind of writing, unless indeed it is coarsely sensational, and even the literary critic feels embarrassed by it. It is true that Dante and Wagner have smoothed the approach to it. The visionary experience is cloaked, in Dante's case, by the introduction of historical facts and in that of Wagner, by mythological events, so that history and mythology are sometimes taken to be the materials with which these poets worked. But with neither of them does the moving force and the deeper significance lie there. For both, it is contained in the visionary experience. Ryder Haggard, pardonably enough, is generally held to be a mere inventor of fiction. 
Yet even with him, the story is primarily a means of giving expression to significant material. However much the tale may seem to overgrow the content, the latter outweighs the former in importance. The obscurity as to the sources of the material in visionary creation is very strange, and the exact opposite of what we find in the psychological mode of creation. We are even led to suspect that this obscurity is not unintentional. We are naturally inclined to suppose, and Freudian psychology encourages us to do so, that some highly personal experience underlies this grotesque darkness. We hope thus to explain these strange glimpses of chaos and to understand why it sometimes seems as though the poet had intentionally concealed his basic experience from us. It is only a step from this way of looking at the matter to the statement that we are here dealing with a pathological and neurotic art, a step which is justified insofar as the material of the visionary creator shows certain traits that we find in the fantasies of the insane. The converse also is true. We often discover in the mental output of psychotic persons a wealth of meaning that we should expect rather from the works of a genius. The psychologist who follows Freud will of course be inclined to take the writings in question as a problem in pathology, on the assumption that an intimate personal experience underlies what I call the primordial vision, an experience, that is to say, which cannot be accepted by the conscious outlook, he will try to account for the curious images of the vision by calling them cover figures, and by supposing that they represent an attempted concealment of the basic experience. This, according to his view, might be an experience in love which is morally or aesthetically incompatible with the personality as a whole, or at least with certain fictions of the conscious mind. In order that the poet, through his ego, might repress this experience and make it unrecognizable, unconscious, the whole arsenal of a pathological fantasy was brought into action. Moreover, this attempt to replace reality by fiction, being unsatisfactory, must be repeated in a long series of creative embodiments. This would explain the proliferation of imaginative forms, all monstrous, demonic, grotesque, and perverse. On the one hand, they are substitutes for the unacceptable experience, and on the other, they help to conceal it. Although a discussion of the poet's personality and psychic disposition belongs strictly to the second part of my essay, I cannot avoid taking up in the present connection this Freudian view of the visionary work of art. For one thing, it has aroused considerable attention, and then it is the only well-known attempt that has been made to give a scientific explanation of the sources of the visionary material or to formulate a theory of the psychic processes that underlie this curious mode of artistic creation. I assume that my own view of the question is not well known or generally understood. With this preliminary remark, I will now try to present it briefly. If we insist on deriving the vision from a personal experience, we must treat the former as something secondary, as a mere substitute for reality. The result is that we strip the vision of its primordial quality and take it as nothing but a symptom. The pregnant chaos then shrinks to the proportions of a psychic disturbance. With this account of the matter, we feel reassured and turn again to our picture of a well-ordered cosmos. Since we are practical and reasonable, we do not expect the cosmos to be perfect. We accept these unavoidable imperfections which we call abnormalities and diseases and we take it for granted that human nature is not exempt from them. The frightening revelation of abysses that defy the human understanding is dismissed as illusion, and the poet is regarded as a victim and perpetrator of deception. Even to the poet, his primordial experience was human, all too human, to such a degree that he could not face its meaning, but had to conceal it from himself. We shall do well, I think, to make fully explicit all the implications of that way of accounting for artistic creation, which consists in reducing it to personal factors. We should see clearly where it leads. The truth is that it takes us away from the psychological study of the work of art and confronts us with the psychic disposition of the poet himself. That the latter presents an important problem is not to be denied, but the work of art is something in its own right and may not be conjured away. The question of the significance to the poet of his own creative work, of his regarding it as a trifle, as a screen, as a source of suffering, or as an achievement, 
does not concern us at the moment, our task being to interpret the work of art psychologically. For this undertaking, it is essential that we give serious consideration to the basic experience that underlies it, namely, to the vision. We must take it at least as seriously as we do the experiences that underlie the psychological mode of artistic creation, and no one doubts that they are both real and serious. It looks indeed as if the visionary experience were something quite apart from the ordinary lot of man, and for this reason we have difficulty in believing that it is real. It has about it an unfortunate suggestion of obscure metaphysics and of occultism, so that we feel called upon to intervene in the name of a well-intentioned reasonableness. Our conclusion is that it would be better not to take such things too seriously, lest the world revert again to a benighted superstition. We may, of course, have a predilection for the occult, but ordinarily we dismiss the visionary experience as the outcome of a rich fantasy or of a poetic mood, that is to say, as a kind of poetic license psychologically understood. Certain of the poets encourage this interpretation in order to put a wholesome distance between themselves and their work. Spietler, for example, stoutly maintained that it was one and the same, whether the poet sang of an Olympian spring or to the theme, May is here. The truth is that poets are human beings, and that what a poet has to say about his work is often far from being the most illuminating word on the subject. What is required of us, then, is nothing less than to defend the importance of the visionary experience against the poet himself. It cannot be denied that we catch the reverberations of an initial love experience in The Shepherd of Hermas, in the Divine Comedy, and in the Faust drama, an experience which is completed and fulfilled by the vision. There is no ground for the assumption that the second part of Faust repudiates or conceals the normal human experience of the first part, nor are we justified in supposing that Goethe was normal at the time when he wrote Part One but in an erotic state of mind when he composed Part Two, Hermes, Dante, and Goethe can be taken as three steps in a sequence covering nearly 2,000 years of human development. And in each of them, we find the personal love episode not only connected with the weightier visionary experience, but frankly subordinated to it. On the strength of this evidence, which is furnished by the work of art itself, and which throws out of court the question of the poet's particular psychic disposition, we must admit that the vision represents a deeper and more impressive experience than human passion. In works of art of this nature, and we must never confuse them with the artist as a person, we cannot doubt that the vision is a genuine primordial experience, regardless of what reason mongers may say. The vision is not something derived or secondary, and it is not a symptom of something else. It is true symbolic expression, that is, the expression of something existent in its own right, but imperfectly known. The love episode is a real experience really suffered, and the same statement applies to the vision. We need not try to determine whether the content of the vision is of a physical, psychic, or metaphysical nature. In itself, it has psychic reality and this is no less real than physical reality. Human passion falls within the sphere of conscious experience, while the subject of the vision lies beyond it. Through our feelings we experience the known, but our intuitions point to things that are unknown and hidden, that by their very nature are secret. If ever they became conscious, they are intentionally kept back and concealed, for which reason they have been regarded from earliest times as mysterious, uncanny, and deceptive. They are hidden from the scrutiny of man, and he also hides himself from them out of Dicedaemonia. He protects himself with the shield of science and the armor of reason. His enlightenment is born of fear. In the daytime, he believes in an ordered cosmos, and he tries to maintain this faith against the fear of chaos that besets him by night. What if there were some living force whose sphere of action lies beyond our world of every day? Are there human needs that are dangerous and unavoidable? Is there something more purposeful than electrons? Do we delude ourselves in thinking that we possess and command our own souls? And is that which science calls the psyche not merely a question mark arbitrarily confined within the skull, but rather a door that opens upon the human world from a world beyond? 
now and again allowing strange and unseizable potencies to act upon man and to remove him, as if upon the wings of the night, from the level of common humanity to that of a more than personal vocation? When we consider the visionary mode of artistic creation, it even seems as if the love episode had served as a mere release, as if the personal experience were nothing but the prelude to the all-important divine comedy. It is not alone the creator of this kind of art who is in touch with the night side of life, but the seers, prophets, leaders, and enlighteners also. However dark this nocturnal world may be, it is not wholly unfamiliar. Man has known of it from time immemorial, here, there, and everywhere. For primitive man today, it is an unquestionable part of his picture of the cosmos. It is only we who have repudiated it because of our fear of superstition and metaphysics, and because we strive to construct a conscious world that is safe and manageable in that natural law holds in it the place of statute law in a commonwealth. Yet, even in our midst, the poet now and then catches sight of the figures that people the night world, the spirits, demons, and gods. He knows that a purposiveness, outreaching human ends, is the life-giving secret for man. He has a presentiment of incomprehensible happenings in the Pleroma. In short, he sees something of that psychic world that strikes terror into the savage and the barbarian. From the very first beginnings of human society onward, man's efforts to give his vague intimations of binding form have left their traces. Even in the Rhodesian cliff drawings of the old Stone Age, there appears, side by side with the most amazingly lifelike representations of animals, an abstract pattern, a double cross contained in a circle. This design has turned up in every cultural region, more or less, and we find it today not only in Christian churches, but in Tibetan monasteries as well. It is the so-called sun wheel. And as it dates from a time when no one had thought of wheels as a mechanical device, it cannot have had its source in any experience of the external world. It is rather a symbol that stands for a psychic happening. It covers an experience of the inner world, and is no doubt as lifelike a representation as the famous rhinoceros with the tick birds on its back. There has never been a primitive culture that did not possess a system of secret teaching, and in many cultures this system is highly developed. The men's councils and the totem clans preserve this teaching about hidden things that lie apart from man's daytime existence, things which, from primeval times, have always constituted his most vital experiences. Knowledge about them is handed on to younger men in the rites of initiation, the mysteries of the Greco-Roman world performed the same office, and the rich mythology of antiquity is a relic of such experiences in the earliest stages of human development. It is therefore to be expected of the poet that he will resort to mythology in order to give his experience its most fitting expression. It would be a serious mistake to suppose that he works with materials received at second hand. The primordial experience is the source of its creativeness. It cannot be fathomed, and therefore requires mythological imagery to give it form. In itself, it offers no words or images, for it is a vision seen as in a glass darkly. It is merely a deep presentiment that strives to find expression. It is like a whirlwind that seizes everything within reach and, by carrying it aloft, assumes a visible shape. Since the particular expression can never exhaust the possibilities of the vision, but falls far short of it in richness of content, the poet must have at his disposal a huge store of materials if he is to communicate even a few of his intimations. What is more, he must resort to an imagery that is difficult to handle and full of contradictions in order to express the weird paradoxality of his vision. Dante's presentiments are clothed in images that run the gamut of heaven and hell. Goethe must bring in the Blocksburg and the infernal regions of Greek antiquity. Wagner needs the whole body of Nordic myth. Nietzsche returns to the hieratic style and recreates the legendary seer of prehistoric times. Blake invents for himself indescribable figures, and Spietler borrows old names for new creatures of the imagination and no intermediate step is missing in the whole range from the ineffably sublime to the perversely grotesque. 
Psychology can do nothing towards the elucidation of this colorful imagery except bring together materials for comparison and offer a terminology for its discussion. According to this terminology, that which appears in the vision is the collective unconscious. We mean by collective unconscious a certain psychic disposition shaped by the forces of heredity. From it, consciousness has developed. In the physical structure of the body, we find traces of earlier stages of evolution, and we may expect the human psyche also to conform in its makeup to the law of phylogeny. It is a fact that in eclipses of consciousness, in dreams, narcotic states, and cases of insanity, there come to the surface psychic products or contents that show all the traits of primitive levels of psychic development. The images themselves are sometimes of such a primitive character that we might suppose them derived from ancient esoteric teaching. Mythological themes clothed in modern dress also frequently appear. What is of particular importance for the study of literature in these manifestations of the collective unconscious is that they are compensatory to the conscious attitude. This is to say that they can bring a one-sided, abnormal, or dangerous state of consciousness into equilibrium in an apparently purposive way. In dreams, we can see this process very clearly in its positive aspect. In cases of insanity, the compensatory process is often perfectly obvious, but takes a negative form. There are persons, for instance, who have anxiously shut themselves off from all the world only to discover one day that their most intimate secrets are known and talked about by everyone. If we consider Goethe's Faust and leave aside the possibility that it is compensatory to his own conscious attitude, the question that we must answer is this. In what relation does it stand to the conscious outlook of his time? Great poetry draws its strength from the life of mankind, and we completely miss its meaning if we try to derive it from personal factors. Whenever the collective unconscious becomes a living experience and is brought to bear upon the conscious outlook of an age, this event is a creative act which is of importance to everyone living in that age. A work of art is produced that contains what may truthfully be called a message to generations of men. So Faust touches something in the soul of every German. So also Dante's fame is immortal, while the shepherd of Hermas just failed of inclusion in the New Testament canon. Every period has its bias, its particular prejudice and its psychic ailment. An epoch is like an individual. It has its own limitations of conscious outlook, and therefore requires a compensatory adjustment. This is affected by the collective unconscious in that a poet, a seer, or a leader allows himself to be guided by the unexpressed desire of his times and shows the way, by word or deed, to the attainment of that which everyone blindly craves and expects, whether this attainment results in good or evil the healing of an epoch or its destruction. It is always dangerous to speak of one's own times, because what is at stake in the present is too vast for comprehension. A few hints must therefore suffice. Francesco Coyona's book is cast in the form of a dream, and is the apotheosis of natural love taken as a human relation. Without countenancing a wild indulgence of the senses, he leaves completely aside the Christian sacrament of marriage, the book was written in 1453. Writer Haggard, whose life coincides with the flowering time of the Victorian era, takes up this subject and deals with it in his own way. He does not cast it in the form of a dream, but allows us to feel the tension of moral conflict. Goethe weaves the theme of Gretchen Helen Mater Gloriosa like a red thread into the colorful tapestry of Faust. Nietzsche proclaims the death of God, and Spietler transforms the waxing and waning of the gods into a myth of the seasons. Whatever his importance, each of these poets speaks with the voice of thousands and ten thousands, foretelling changes in the conscious outlook of his time. 2. The Poet Creativeness, like the freedom of the will, contains a secret. The psychologist can describe both these manifestations as processes, but he can find no solution of the philosophical problems they offer. Creative man is a riddle that we may try to answer in various ways, but always in vain, a truth that has not prevented modern psychology from turning now and again to the question of the artist and his art. 
Freud thought that he had found a key in his procedure of deriving the work of art from the personal experiences of the artist. It is true that certain possibilities lay in this direction, for it was conceivable that a work of art, no less than a neurosis, might be traced back to those knots in psychic life that we call the complexes. It was Freud's great discovery that neuroses have a causal origin in the psychic realm, that they take their rise from emotional states and from real or imagined childhood experiences. Certain of his followers, like Rank and Steckel, have taken up related lines of enquiry and have achieved important results. It is undeniable that the poet's psychic disposition permeates his work root and branch. Nor is there anything new in the statement that personal factors largely influence the poet's choice and use of his materials. Credit, however, must certainly be given to the Freudian school for showing how far-reaching this influence is and in what curious ways it comes to expression. Freud takes the neurosis as a substitute for a direct means of gratification. He therefore regards it as something inappropriate, a mistake, a dodge, an excuse, a voluntary blindness. To him, it is essentially a shortcoming that should never have been. Since a neurosis, to all appearances, is nothing but a disturbance that is all the more irritating because it is without sense or meaning, few people will venture to say a good word for it. And a work of art is brought into questionable proximity with the neurosis when it is taken as something which can be analyzed in terms of the poet's repressions. In a sense, it finds itself in good company, for religion and philosophy are regarded in the same light by Freudian psychology. No objection can be raised if it is admitted that this approach amounts to nothing more than the elucidation of those personal determinants without which a work of art is unthinkable. But should the claim be made that such an analysis accounts for the work of art itself, then a categorical denial is called for. The personal idiosyncrasies that creep into a work of art are not essential. In fact, the more we have to cope with these peculiarities, the less it is a question of art. What is essential in a work of art is that it should rise far above the realm of personal life and speak from the spirit and heart of the poet as man to the spirit and heart of mankind. The personal aspect is a limitation and even a sin in the realm of art. When a form of art is primarily personal, it deserves to be treated as if it were a neurosis. There may be some validity in the idea held by the Freudian school that artists without exception are narcissistic, by which is meant that they are undeveloped persons with infantile and autoerotic traits. The statement is only valid, however, for the artist as a person and has nothing to do with the man as an artist. In his capacity of artist, he is neither autoerotic nor heteroerotic nor erotic in any sense. He is objective and impersonal, even inhuman, for as an artist, he is his work and not a human being. Every creative person is a duality or a synthesis of contradictory aptitudes. On the one side, he is a human being with a personal life, while on the other side, he is an impersonal, creative process. Since as a human being he may be sound or morbid, we must look at his psychic makeup to find the determinants of his personality. But we can only understand him in his capacity of artist by looking at his creative achievement. We should make a sad mistake if we try to explain the mode of life of an English gentleman, a Prussian officer, or a cardinal in terms of personal factors. The gentleman, the officer, and the cleric function as such in an impersonal role, and their psychic makeup is qualified by a peculiar objectivity. We must grant that the artist does not function in an official capacity. The very opposite is nearer the truth. He nevertheless resembles the types I have named in one respect, for the specifically artistic disposition involves an overweight of collective psychic life as against the personal. Art is a kind of innate drive that seizes a human being and makes him its instrument. The artist is not a person endowed with free will who seeks his own ends, but one who allows art to realize its purposes through him. As a human being, he may have moods and a will and personal aims, but as an artist, he is man in a higher sense. He is collective man, one who carries and shapes the unconscious psychic life of mankind. 
To perform this difficult office, it is sometimes necessary for him to sacrifice happiness and everything that makes life worth living for the ordinary human being. All this being so, it is not strange that the artist is an especially interesting case for the psychologist who uses an analytical method. The artist's life cannot be otherwise than full of conflicts, for two forces are at war within him. On the one hand, the common human longing for happiness, satisfaction, and security in life, and on the other, a ruthless passion for creation, which may go so far as to override every personal desire. The lives of artists are as a rule so highly unsatisfactory, not to say tragic, because of their inferiority on the human and personal side, and not because of a sinister dispensation. There are hardly any exceptions to the rule that a person must pay dearly for the divine gift of the creative fire. It is as though each of us were endowed, at birth, with a certain capital of energy. The strongest force in our makeup will seize and all but monopolize this energy, leaving so little over that nothing of value can come of it. In this way, the creative force can drain the human impulses to such a degree that the personal ego must develop all sorts of bad qualities, ruthlessness, selfishness, and vanity, so-called autoerotism, and every kind of vice in order to maintain the spark of life and to keep itself from being wholly bereft. The autoerotism of artists resembles that of illegitimate or neglected children, who from their tenderest years must protect themselves from the destructive influence of people who have no love to give them, who develop bad qualities for that very purpose, and later maintain an invincible egocentrism by remaining all their lives infantile and helpless or by actively offending against the moral code or the law. How can we doubt that it is his art that explains the artist and not the insufficiencies and conflicts of his personal life? These are nothing but the regrettable results of the fact that he is an artist, that is to say, a man who from his very birth has been called to a greater task than the ordinary mortal. A special ability means a heavy expenditure of energy in a particular direction, with a consequent drain from some other side of life. It makes no difference whether the poet knows that his work is begotten, grows and matures with him, or whether he supposes that by taking thought he produces it out of the void. His opinion of the matter does not change the fact that his own work outgrows him as a child its mother. The creative process has feminine quality, and the creative work arises from unconscious depths, we might say, from the realm of the mothers. Whenever the creative force predominates, human life is ruled and molded by the unconscious as against the active will, and the conscious ego is swept along on a subterranean current, being nothing more than a helpless observer of events. The work in process becomes the poet's fate and determines his psychic development. It is not Goethe who creates Faust, but Faust which creates Goethe. And what is Faust but a symbol? By this I do not mean an allegory that points to something all too familiar, but an expression that stands for something not clearly known and yet profoundly alive. Here it is something that lives in the soul of every German, and that Goethe has helped to bring to birth. Could we conceive of anyone but a German writing Faust, or thus spoke Zarathustra? Both play upon something that reverberates in the German soul, a primordial image, as Jacob Burckhardt once called it, the figure of the physician or teacher of mankind. The archetypal image of the wise man, the savior or redeemer, lies buried and dormant in man's unconscious since the dawn of culture. It is awakened whenever the times are out of joint and a human society is committed to a serious error. When people go astray, they feel the need of a guide or teacher or even of the physician. These primordial images are numerous, but do not appear in the dreams of individuals or in works of art until they are called into being by the waywardness of the general outlook. When conscious life is characterized by one-sidedness and by a false attitude, then they are activated, one might say, instinctively, and come to light in the dreams of individuals and the visions of artists and seers, thus restoring the psychic equilibrium of the epoch. In this way, the work of the poet comes to meet the spiritual need of the society in which he lives and for this reason his work means more to him than his personal fate, whether he is aware of this or not. 
being essentially the instrument for his work, he is subordinate to it, and we have no reason for expecting him to interpret it for us. He has done the best that in him lies in giving it form, and he must leave the interpretation to others and to the future. A great work of art is like a dream. For all its apparent obviousness, it does not explain itself and is never unequivocal. A dream never says, you ought, or this is the truth. It presents an image in much the same way as nature allows a plant to grow, and we must draw our own conclusions. If a person has a nightmare, it means either that he is too much given to fear or else that he is too exempt from it, and if he dreams of the old wise man, it may mean that he is too pedagogical, as also that he stands in need of a teacher. In a subtle way, both meanings come to the same thing, as we perceive when we are able to let the work of art act upon us as it acted upon the artist. To grasp its meaning, we must allow it to shape us as it once shaped him. Then we understand the nature of his experience. We see that he has drawn upon the healing and redeeming forces of the collective psyche that underlies consciousness with its isolation and its painful errors. That he has penetrated to that matrix of life in which all men are embedded, which imparts a common rhythm to all human existence, and allows the individual to communicate his feeling and his striving to mankind as a whole. The secret of artistic creation and of the effectiveness of art is to be found in a return to the state of mystical participation, to that level of experience at which it is man who lives, and not the individual, and at which the weal or woe of the single human being does not count, but only human existence. This is why every great work of art is objective and impersonal but none the less profoundly moves us each and all. And this is also why the personal life of the poet cannot be held essential to his art, but at most a help or a hindrance to his creative task. He may go the way of a Philistine, a good citizen, a neurotic, a fool, or a criminal. His personal career may be inevitable and interesting, but it does not explain the poet.